Hello everybody, welcome back to another movie review, and this time I'm going to do a movie that, uh, honestly, this is one I have been wanting to talk about for a long time, and probably, again, just like The Changeling, is another movie that, honestly, I think is one of the absolute creepiest I've ever seen in my life, and this, of course, is The Shining. The Shining is a horror supernatural film that came out back in 1980 and directed by the late, great Stanley Kubrick. And is also based on the novel of the same name by Stephen King. So, the movie is basically about a school teacher slash writer named Jack Torrance, played in the film by Jack Nicholson, as he has become the caretaker of the secluded Overlook Hotel. Overlook Hotel is basically a resort deep in the Colorado mountains, which shuts down over winter due to the massive snowfall. And ultimately, Jack has been assigned to be the caretaker. Basically, he brings his wife, Wendy, and his, and his son, Danny, to the hotel so they can watch over it for the few months until the hotel opens up again in the following spring. But unfortunately, before Jack... Uh, before the interview is over, Jack is ultimately reminded about what happened to the previous caretaker. And he went insane, killed his family, and killed himself. And Jack is like kind of shrugging it off saying, nah, that's not going to happen. But of course, as the time goes on, he slowly begins to lose his, he slowly begins to lose his sanity. And it ends up reaching a peak where he ends up trying to kill his wife and son. And of course, uh, his son Danny ultimately has a special power, a special secret power that his parents seem to know nothing about, which is ultimately called the Shining, which he uh, discovers when he meets up with, uh, you know, the the hotel chef Dick Halloran, played in the film by the great Scatman Crothers. And he uh, tells Danny that he too understands uh, what uh, Dan the power that Danny has. And apparently Danny's power ultimately allows him to see sort of the events that occurred inside the hotel over time and ultimately things that have yet to be. And most of the visions he has is just nothing short of just absolute terrifying, to say the least. So yeah, that's pretty much the gist of the movie uh, in a nutshell. I mean, I there are other things uh, obviously I want to go into. I mean, I really did. I really didn't want to speak too much about the plot of the film because this movie is almost universally known to just about every horror fan out there. But I feel like I just wanted to throw my two cents and uh, to the to put in the script uh, the story of uh, if for anybody that still has yet to see the movie. But yeah, The Shining uh, ultimately. Uh, after Stanley Kubrick basically uh, put out Barry Lyndon in 1975 and for Warner Brothers, and he uh, the movie obviously was not a big hit when it debuted, but it was a critical darling when it came out, being nominated for a bunch of Oscars. It was a nominee for Best Picture. It was well, I mean, critically it was successful. Financially, not so much. And then he decided to take a stab at uh, doing another film movie movie based on a novel, and for some reason. The Stephen King book, The Shining, got his attention, and he decided to adapt that into a feature-length movie. But here's the thing. Kubrick's version of The Shining, while it does follow the book to a certain point, it is basically what you call a loose adaptation, because Kubrick wanted to make the movie more his own and not what Stephen King wanted. Since the book features a lot of, uh, you know, dialogue and there's a lot of, you know, conversations about things that occurred in the movie, occurred in the story or events that have happened. I mean, since uh, the, the form, the social media of, uh, you know, physical of, uh, you know, movies is basically a visual media where it's all about show and don't tell. So basically Kubrick decided to cut most of the dialogue out of the, mo out of the story and focus more on the uh, the horror and the action details. So, for that, I really have to give him some credibility there. And it does pack a lot into its 144-minute uh, time limit. So, yeah, this is a rather lengthy movie for... And, of course, yeah, Kubrick is known for doing some... Length... Some of his films are pretty lengthy, too. Like, you know, look at Spartacus is, like, pushing three hours. Hell, Barry Lyndon is three hours long. 2001 A Space Odyssey is almost two and a half hours long, so so yeah, many of his movies are, many of his movies 
push or get close to the two and a half hour mark. And at the time, this was probably, I think, yeah, for 144 minutes, at the time, this might have been the lengthiest horror movie ever made to get a theatrical release. And I think very recently, It Chapter 2 has uh, surpassed that. Yeah, I think It Chapter 2 might be the longest horror film I've ever seen theatrically, because that movie is almost, that movie is like, what, maybe 11 minutes shy of three hours? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Jack Kroll Newsweek called The Shining the first epic horror film. Yeah, that's pretty much what it is. I mean, yeah, I could go into detail about, you know, all the uh, the difference and the changes between the book and the movie. I mean, obviously in the movie there's a hedge maze, but in the uh, the book there was not. There were these topiary, like, you know, figures made of uh, bushes. And, and obviously uh, the movie at the time, while the movie was a profitable hit when it debuted in 1980... Uh, it did not receive the uh, financial success that Kubrick was really hoping for the film to have. Even though the film did have, did have box off, it did have the star power. I mean, you know, Jack Nicholson, Shelley Duvall, um, Scab. Well, yeah, I mean, it did have the box off. I mean, it did kind of have the star power. I mean, obviously, Jack Nicholson is the ultimate scene stealer in the movie, but obviously, people ju it just did not generate enough attention at the time, and. Uh, the movie was made on a pretty decent sized budget of $19 million, which uh, most of the money went to creating the uh, the elaborate set, set pieces with the Overlook Hotel itself, many of them. And the movie, while the film was a, a profitable hit, it grossed over $40 million domestically. Unfortunately, at the time, the critical reception was mostly mixed. There were some people, they either didn't get the film or, you know, didn't... Uh, just didn't quite understand, you know, even though Kubrick really had a, uh, you know, a name to himself at the time, but even, but people just, a lot of people just didn't get the movie. They really didn't get it at all. Even though the movie was primed to be like the next big scary thing since The Exorcist, and unfortunately, a lot of people just didn't really get that. But, and at the time, um, it was the first film that Kubrick directed that, for a while, that didn't rack any Oscar nominations. And also at the Razzies that year in 1981, which, by the way, was the first year they had the Razzies, The Shining picked up two nominations. Worst Actress for Shelley Duvall and Worst Director for Stanley Kubrick, which, to this date, I still don't understand how they got those nominations. I mean, Shelley Duvall is way better in the film than everybody makes her out to be, even though she plays like a... She's constantly in hysterics throughout most of the film, but I'll get to that at one point in the interview, maybe later, in the video, maybe later. But in time, the movie has actually gotten more and more attention over time. Most of the critics that actually gave the film mixed opinions at the time of its release later re-reviewed the film and honestly started giving it glowing reviews. Like Roger Ebert, in, its, uh, in his initial rating, I think out of four stars, he gave it a two. But he later re-reviewed the film, and he gave it a solid 4 out of 4, saying not only is it one of the best horror films of all time, it's one of the best movies ever made, period. Steven Spielberg considers The Shining one of his absolute favorite movies of all time. And it's funny because right after uh, Kubrick finished up uh, filming The Shining, the very same set that The Shining was being filmed on, Steven Spielberg later used for uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. The, uh, the hotel lobby where Jack is seen doing all the typing in the film, that was later used for the uh, Well of Souls in Raiders of the Lost Ark. And that's actually how uh, Spielberg became really good friends with uh, Kubrick because they were getting ready to, they were shooting, uh, they're, each other were shooting their films. And of course, uh, uh, Steven Spielberg became a lifelong friend of Kubrick up until his uh, passing in 99. But over time though, The Shining really, like I said, the first time I saw it, yeah, I was actually a young kid when I saw The Shining for the first time, and yeah, it scared the absolute hell out of me. And even to this day, it still frightens the heck out of me. Many of the things in the film have become infamous over time. Like, I mean, who could forget the two girls in the hallway uh, going into room 237, which is funny because in the book, the room number is 217. But in the movie, it's 237 because the reason why is because the hotel that they were actually shooting the movie at had a room 217. But they were afraid of filming it there because when people found out about the hotel number being used, they were the hotel was kind of worried about that people would not be using that room anymore. So the number 237 was used 
as a fake number because the number 237 didn't exist in the hotel there. So naturally, they used that number. And of course, the number 237 became sort of famous for many other Stephen King adaptations. In the film Stand By Me, when the boys are uh, adding up to see how much money they had to go buy stuff, their number, ad I believe uh, one kid had a dollar two, then there were 68 cents, and there were 60 cents and 7 cents. All, add all that up together, that's $2.37. And in The Shawshank Redemption, Red, Morgan Freeman's character, his cell number was 237. So that number just became sort of, it just had to keep popping up in later Stephen King movies, didn't it? And as I've said before that this is a Stephen King film adaptation, unfortunately, out of all the feet people out there that actually enjoyed this movie, Stephen King himself was one of the very few people who just, just did not like the movie at all. He just hated the film so much because of how much it differs from the, uh, from the book itself. Yeah, I know, it's Christmas music playing in the background. My mom has a uh, clock <laughs> that plays Christmas music every hour in the hour. Sorry about that. But, um, yeah, he unfortunately was not the biggest fan of the uh, movie itself. And and in time past, you know, he has, you know, kind of opened up a little more about the movie. But he still he still prefers, you know, while the movie has some good moments, very effective moments... He still, he still, I think at one point he did uh, refer to the film as a car without the engine. I think that's the best way he described The Shining, the Kubrick film. Because as I've said, there are many things in the movie that differ from the book. The book has more dialogue, more talking. The movie kind of eliminates most of that. Um, there's a hedge maze in the movie, but there isn't one in the book. And also, Stephen King was really upset with the casting. Like, he didn't like uh, the casting of Jack Nicholson as Jack Torrance. He didn't like the casting of Shelley Duvall as Wendy Torrance. Although, Scabman Crothers, who played Dick Halloran, he was, he was pretty spot on to the character. And, uh, well, at the Saturn Awards in 1981, his performance was deemed so well, he ended up taking home the Saturn that year for Best Supporting Actor, which, uh, you know, he rightfully deserved because he really was one of the best characters in the movie but yeah the movie had many uh and of course uh now i'm going to get into the fact that one of the things a lot of people know well about the movie and know well about stanley kubrick is uh kubrick is known for being a perfectionist he wouldn't just shoot like five or six takes and be done with that he would shoot a scene 30 40 maybe 50 times before he's satisfied with what he's got and that's something that, you know, anybody that's worked with Kubrick in the past will tell you that he's just a total nightmare to work with. But hey, it's all about perfection. And while the movie does have a few flaws plagued here and there throughout the film, I wouldn't say the movie is perfect, but at the same time, you just can't help but admire what Kubrick really, what was going through Kubrick's mind when he was coming up with the concepts for this movie. And now I want to get into the fact that, honestly... Out of all the actors in the film, the one I really feel for the most is Shelley Duvall. Because this poor girl was literally pushed to no end in The Shining. Like, she literally was, like, constantly in hysterics the whole time. It's, it's as if Kubrick basically wanted her to be in that mode the whole time the movie came, the whole time of the movie. And there were many scenes where she just, she was just pushed to, you know dehydration because you know constantly being in hysterics she ran her tear ducts ran dry she had to constantly stay hydrated the whole time and he also told the cast and crew to not you know interact with her to basically have her completely alienated because of the fact that in the movie her character literally does become alienated by the film's end literally like nobody's there to help her her husband's you know gone off the deep end her son literally is you know, mentally gone, sort of, but yeah, she's all by herself. And although I'm sure Kubrick, you know, has over time admitted that maybe he did push her way too far, he might have, I don't know, but, and even Shelly, it, it left a permanent scar on her uh, psyche in the years to follow, and I really just feel for the one, I really feel for her. So honestly, her getting nominated for Worst Actress of the Razzies, I, I just say, seriously, and I'm glad the Razzies later rescinded the uh, nomination because when they found out about how terrible Kubrick really pushed this poor woman, 
You know, they were like, oh, okay, never mind. I mean, that was actually how he wanted her character to be. And honestly, over time, the more I watch the movie, I actually think her performance really is much better than what it seems to be. Even to this day, Jack Nicholson even um, praises her for her role. He still does, to this day. So, that's one thing I, I noticed that a lot of people, some people are like, oh, Shelley Duvall was the worst then. No, no, she is not. I, <laughs> she, definitely delivered her, she definitely delivered a great role in the film, more than what most people make it out to be. Way better. As for Jack Nicholson, oh yeah, he just, he just delivers every scene. Like I said, every scene he's in, he just commands it. Literally. I feel like he should have been nominated for an Oscar for that role. That's how good he was in the movie. As for the kid that played Danny, honestly, he did a great job too. Danny Lloyd was great. And the funny thing is he didn't even know he was doing a horror film at the time. He had no idea because Kubrick was very protective of him. Danny Lloyd admitted in interviews that he didn't see the movie until... He didn't see The Shining until he was probably a teenager. So, <laughs> there you go. So, yeah, Stephen King was obviously not happy with the way the movie turned out, so that's why later years, Warner Brothers basically gave him the opportunity to make The Shining more to his liking. So that's why in 97, 17 years after The Shining came out, he was allowed to adapt his own version into a miniseries. Which uh, got mixed opinions, but for fans of the book... They'd appreciate the film more because the miniseries more because it follows the book like straight to the T. It it kind of leaves no stone unturned. But there are some fans that while the miniseries did get appreciated for certain things, a lot of people still stick to the Kubrick film because the Kubrick movie obviously is the one they grew up on more. And not to mention it was the only film adaptation of The Shining available at the time. So naturally, people just kind of people just kind of you know were magnetized more to this movie than the miniseries. And while the miniseries did prove effective, it did. I mean, eventually I'll do an interview, I'll do a video on that later, eventually. So, but over time, give The Shining some uh, credit. And honestly, it really does deserve more credit than what it got. And I'm glad that over time, just like uh, many movies, like, you know, uh, another good example, Empire Strikes Back, another movie that obviously didn't get the critical reception it did at the time. And although the movie was a big hit financially, it um, wasn't well received by critics. But in time, the movie, it's now considered the best Star Wars movie of all time. And The Shining, like, it's now considered, it was, like I said, very mixed opinions at the time it came out. But in later years, it's more, it got more reception as time went on. And now it's considered one of the greatest horror movies of all time and one of the greatest movies ever made in history. I still think this is one of the creepiest films I've ever seen. I, st I think it's creepier than The Exorcist. I still think it is. But over overall, like I said, give us some time. More and more people, need, yeah, more, it'll, it'll still get discovered by more and more people. So, enough about the movie. Let's talk about the Blu-ray real fast. Honestly, the Blu-ray of The Shining by Warner Brothers here, I, this is the original release by, in 2007. And honestly... This is, a, this is still a pretty solid release of the movie. I'm still really impressed with what Warner Brothers did with The Shining. And it looks fantastic in high def. It really does. Details you've never seen before. And the original DVD releases of The Shining presented the film in full frame. Where it's funny because I think the original shooting aspect ratio was 166 by 1. I think that's the ratio Kubrick originally shot the movie in. I could be wrong, but they uh, formatted the movie to be in... Uh, widescreen anamorphic, one eight, uh, it's actually in 178 by 1, so there's no black bars. And honestly, the image looks fantastic. I'm very impressed with how well the film looks. Yeah, the aspect ratio might get some controversy by some fans, but honestly, with the level of detail this movie has, and the fact that uh, this is actually the first time I ever got a chance to watch the movie in widescreen, and uh, also... Uh, at my local movie theater, I actually was able to watch this on the big screen at a flashback cinema, so I was able to see The Shining on the big screen, which I'm fine, I'm actually glad I did. So for the video on the on the Blu-ray out of five stars, I would say four and a half out of five. That's how well, that's how good the movie looks. 
I don't know why it says 1A5 because, like I said, on the Blu-ray, there's no black bars. It's 178 by 1. I don't know why it's like that. As for the audio, honestly, the audio is not too bad. You get a couple of flavors here. 5.1 PCM, which is almost equivalent to that of a, well, is it the same as DTS? I don't know, but it, it, that's the loudest audio track that's on the, on the disc. You also get 5.1 Dolby Digital and, of course, French and Spanish tracks. Uh, the, the DC, the PCM track, honestly, not bad, but still, it, um, I don't think it sounds as good as it looks, but for the most part, the dialogue comes out really well, the sound comes out well too, and the music is just as creepy as the movie itself. So I would say out of five stars, the audio, I would probably give it maybe a four out of five. So honestly, it sounds pretty good. As for the bonus features, believe it or not, there's a, uh, Nice, nice wealth of material to go through here. All this material actually came from previous DVD editions, uh, and The Shining was released on DVD as a two-disc special edition before it uh, got released here on Blu-ray. And all these bonus materials are actually really fun. They're actually a great uh, wealth to look through. First of all, you get a commentary track with Garrett Brown, who was the who was the camera operator and also the Steadicam inventor at the time, and historian John Baxter, who is a bit of a Kubrick fanatic himself. And they talk uh, a great detail about the movie, and Garrett Brown actually retains a lot of great memories working on the movie and working with Kubrick and working with all the uh, actors and the crew. There's also a documentary of Making Of, which was directed by Stanley Kubrick's daughter Vivian, as uh, it was actually made during the, uh, the making of the movie itself, with optional commentary by Vivian Kubrick. This was actually on one of the original DVD releases. Um, three brand new featurettes, which are created specifically for this release. We get View from the Overlook, Crafting the Shining, which is sort of like a behind-the-scenes uh, retro on uh, how the movie looks, uh, the look of the movie and everything. The Visions of Stanley Kubrick, uh, again, it's a retro about, you know, all the crazy things that went on, uh, where, I mean, like, makes you think, what was going on in Stanley Kubrick's mind when he was making this movie? All the crazy imagery, you know, like, all the crazy stuff that he wanted in the film. And there's also an uh, interview with the film's composer, Wendy Carlos, as she looks back on the scoring for the movie. And, of course, included as the film's theatrical trailer. So, all in all, it's not a bad selection of material to go through. And while it doesn't feel like much... Remember, it's all about quality over quantity. And the quality of these extras outshine the quantity any day. So I would say out of five stars, the extras get a four out of five. That's how good they are. And while the movie is available in 4K, it is. You can get it on 4K. I don't know where you can get it at really cheap, but Amazon might have it for $20. So the Blu-ray of The Shining you can probably get for maybe, maybe 10 maybe less than that depending on what your preference is, whether you prefer to watch it only on Blu-ray or 4K. Um, I would say for the movie itself, out of five stars, I would say it gets a solid five out of five for me. I grew up with this film. It creeps me out to this day, and honestly, I'm a huge horror fan. You do the math. I definitely want more, and honestly, this is a great creepy flick to watch, especially for the Halloween season, and even for the winter season, too, because uh, it gives you the feeling of being snowbound. It really does. And makes you go a little stir crazy. <laughs> Obviously, in time, The Shining has uh, been influenced by the film has influenced countless films to this day, and of course, countless parodies. Obviously, The Simpsons with its episode uh, in the Treehouse of Horror with uh, Homer getting the shinning. <laughs> All beer and no TV make Jack make Homer something something go crazy. Don't mind if I do. <laughs> But yeah, The Shining has, has become a major influence in horror films over the time. And in many movies, obviously, over time, too. So, honestly, if you, haven't, if you haven't had a chance to watch The Shining yet, definitely give this movie a try. I highly recommend this. If you're in the mood for a good, creepy horror flick... Yeah, I'm sorry, the light's reflecting off. But honestly, if you're in the mood for a good, creepy film, this is definitely one I'd highly recommend. Highly recommend it. So, this concludes the presentation. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will continue to do more of these in the years in the days to come. So until then, take care and be safe. Here's Johnny.